It's more than just another radio show. It's a beacon of truth. Fasten your seatbelt and find out why they call Deacon Harold Burke Sivers the dynamic deacon. Join Deacon Harold for a fast-paced hour that sheds encouraging light on today's culture. Welcome to Beacon of Truth with your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Beacon of Truth. I am your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and you're listening on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. And today is the day after Thanksgiving, uh, also known uh, in the secular culture as Black Friday. You know, uh, so, <laughs> uh, so you know, that means that some of you may be out uh, waiting in those lines, waiting for those great deals uh, to start at the stores. You know, you, this is the, uh, uh, well, for the secular culture, the uh, official start of the Christmas season, but of course, we Catholics, you know, are looking forward in a couple of weeks to the start of Advent, which is our preparation for the Christmas season, you know, which is not just a day for us, but for uh, an entire season, right, an entire church season of Christmas. And so, um, you know, hopefully, you know, that uh, you're, you're still feeling a little bit stuffed, you know, you're... Uh, thinking about those leftovers already today, you know, <laughs> that's what I mean. That's what I love. I, one of the things I love is uh, leftover Thanksgiving dinner, you know, uh, almost like, you know, when you get that second day pizza, like you eat it the, the second day, heat it up and, you know, the, how good that is the second time around. Well, Thanksgiving dinner is the same thing. So I'm sure you have plenty of leftovers. Um, but today I'm very, very excited uh, we're going to have a guest on Deacon Mike Oles who's talk about, uh, talking about Off the Streets, an incredible, incredible ministry to, uh, to our homeless brothers and sisters. Of course, we're thinking about them in a special way um, at this time of the year, um, and, and especially many cities uh, for years now have, uh, well, I, you can call it the homeless pandemic. You know, when you look at San Francisco and Los Angeles and, and New York and even here in Portland, Oregon, um, you know, especially since the pandemic, you know, there's just been um, a, a, almost an explosion of homelessness uh, in, in many cities around the United States. And, uh, you know, city governments are cannot um, get their their arms around what to do about this problem. Uh, some people are encouraging homelessness uh their programs where they're uh, for example in uh, there's a city in oregon where they're uh allowing the homeless to set up tents in, in in parks and other public spaces and they're providing food and even drugs to uh you know narcotics to some of these uh, homeless folks and setting up uh porta potties and things like that so they're not really helping the problem they're kind of encouraging it you know, so um, I think in people's hearts, there's a desire there to help, but they're just not sure how to do it. Well, I'll tell you right, you're going to listen, you're going to hear today. Deacon Mike has, uh, is off the streets, which is featured, by the way, in my book, Our Life of Service, The Handbook of Catholic Deacons. Uh, if you look in, toward the, the, the end of that book, I talk about the service ministry of, the, of deacons outside of the parish. And I highlight Deacon Mike and his work with Off the Streets because they're, just, they're doing an incredible job. And this goes to show uh, when the church emphasizes the, the um, principle of subsidiarity, where problems within the culture, um, you know, uh, when it comes, especially when it comes to homelessness and, and, and problems of, of those nature, kind of social justice problems should be kind of maintained at the lowest level. You know, uh, churches and faith-based institutions and NGOs, you know, um, uh, should be the ones kind of driving uh, uh, the work of, of um, dealing with these societal issues and not just always government throwing money at it or, or politicians trying to fix it, but supporting um, apostolates like uh, off the streets uh, that are making a huge difference in not just getting people off the streets, but restoring the dignity 
of each of our brothers and sisters made in the image and likeness of God. So very excited to talk about the, with Deacon Mike about off the streets today. And, uh, you know, uh, for me, you know, again, I mentioned today, today is also Black Friday. I, I am not a shopper. Uh, I don't like going shopping at all. So I will not be in the malls if they're still malls uh, you know you, you drive around this there's, there's uh you know you either have these massive malls or you have no malls at all you know just kind of it just kind of depends but i am not a uh shopper um for years now uh when it comes to um uh shopping i i just i i know what i want ahead of time i go i get what i want and i leave you know, window shopping and, and, and that kind of thing doesn't work for me. And part of it is because um, when we think of uh, what's most valuable to you, um, obviously outside of my relationship with God and, and my faith in, in Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church, right? that, that, of course, that's first and foremost. But um, it's time. It's time. Because time, you can't get back. You know, we're not God that exists outside of time, right? Um, time is very linear for us as human beings. And when you expend time, you don't get that time back, right? We, we, we're not time travelers. You can't go back in time. Uh, so my time is very valuable. And I don't want to spend that time shopping, quite honestly. I mean, I, I don't even do Amazon or, any, or online services that much. Um, you know, I let my, let my wife, uh, deal with all of that. Um, but you know, and some of you like that thrill of, of going out there and, uh, being part of the crowd and getting those bargains and deals. There's something very tangible about that. Um, so just be, you know, just be safe out there to be considerate. You know, don't, don't get to the road rage thing, you know, maybe say a little Hail Mary or listen to Catholic radio or something or some calming music while you're uh, right in the midst of all of this. And uh, so you can have a peaceful time uh, as you're, you know, uh, you know, thinking about uh, uh, different gifts you want to get for family, friends and loved ones. And uh, speaking of friends, we have many friends that make this show uh, run smoothly every single day. We have Matt Kabinsky screening calls and Charles Berry doing social media and our, uh, Good Friday, uh, not good, well, Good Friday too, but Black Friday DJ extraordinaire producer Ace McKay. Hey, bud. Ace, how's it going today? I, I know that you know Thanksgiving is a, it's a huge deal for you. How'd yes. it go? It was great. It's one of those where I know you are a man of routine, and our Thanksgiving is of anything routine. We start with coffee, cake, and wassail for those who come early. We have lunch by noon, then we watch the game and maybe take a nap. You know, some people won't admit they actually fell asleep, but they did. Um, and then the second wave of my friends and any family that's still around kind of goes on into the late hours. So I'm a little tired today. Totally worth it, though. And now I just have to use the weekend to rejuice up before we put the tree and everything up uh, later tonight. All right. All right. So, uh uh, what what kind of musical musical selections did you guys uh, play during Thanksgiving, or if if any at all? Yeah, well, of course. So when I'm cooking, it's typically kind of a hodgepodge of a lot of things. Uh, so uh, once everybody comes over, I usually go to an oldies playlist because the music of the '60s and late '50s is my mom's jam. And so anything musical, I found that when uh, my parents are over, if I have their music playing. The spirits are just because like, you know, mom's dancing around the living room or she's helping to set the table and just like <laughs> that frame of mind. Everybody just feeds off my mom's energy when that's happening. So I learned that years ago. But then once the transition after that, typically it's, you know, Beatles or, you know, something zeppelin -y or, you know, something that my friends are into, especially if it's new. Because then when they come over, I'm like, hey, have you got to check out this new album or this new artist I found? So those conversations are a part of the evening uh, Thanksgiving festivities. So uh, it's, it's, it's a nice little buffet, if you will, of music. Oh, awesome. You know, for, for us, we have... Um uh, my oldest daughter brought her guitar over mm. and my son pulled out his bass and we uh, did a little bit of jamming. My other daughter uh, uh, will not be home until she's, she lives outside of the state now. So she won't be home until Christmas, right. you know, so we couldn't get her involved. But 
but we did a little bit of jamming and then during you know during the other times you know we all take turns playing uh our playlist songs and things like that or and same thing hey check out this have you heard this mm. so you have you heard this new song or have you heard this group before and yeah and uh so yeah music is a very important part of our of our thanksgiving of course we have mass as well and sure and we used to have a tradition of going to help and serve the homeless on thanksgiving uh, we used to do that in our parish but now you know uh you know our parish is older now and things like that so we weren't able to do that this year sadly yeah well and i i'm always a, a, a huge believer music and food so let's take our cues from thanksgiving and do that all year long amen well, we're going to be talking with Deacon Mike Oles about uh, Off the Streets, an incredible apostle he's working, that he's started and is working with homeless people. We'd love to hear from you today. Send us an email, beacon at EW10.com. Oh, oh yeah. We got, we got the festive music now. Now anytime the season. Anytime there's jingle bells, it's a Christmas song. Which ironically You know, it's that I was gonna say, I don't know no, if I was you gonna rem- say that too kinda has like an Irish feel to it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Almost like feel like doing a jig or something to that. Help yourself. I would love to see that actually. <laughs> um, I was actually talking with a friend of mine. We had a chance to see Mellencamp earlier this year, and his song oh. or, or his version of Wild Nights by Van Morrison has sleigh bells all through it and i'm like why is that song get away with sleigh bells and no one ever you know it's the whole die hard argument is die hard a christmas movie or not right so and because it has sleigh bells but there's nothing about the song that's christmas it's just that one inch so you know yeah more sleigh bells baby. oh a wonderful way to get us into, into the season uh uh great choice great choice do you have a favorite uh, christmas song do I have a favorite Christmas song? Yeah. Uh, well, wow, that's a good question. You know, uh, I, I like stuff like Joy to the World, Silent Night. Like more, more the traditional kind of stuff for me. Yeah. Yeah. Little Drummer Boy, any yeah, version. Awesome. And, yeah. and, and Carol of the yeah, Bells, yeah. those two, you know. Of I always, course, as a drummer. I always feel like as a drummer, I have to. But Carol of the Bells, there's something about that, the melody of that song. Every incarnation I've ever heard, it never grows stale to me. So... Oh, that's so awesome. Love that. Well, I'm Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and you're listening to Beacon of Truth. And uh, today is the day after Thanksgiving. I hope you guys are enjoying this uh, wonderful time with family, friends, and loved ones. And today, very excited. Uh, In a little bit, we're going to be talking with Deacon Mike Oles about his incredible ministry called Off the Streets. You're going to love hearing about uh, how uh, Deacon Mike is working and how the, the th- and with the church, through the church, to, uh, to really address this uh, problem of homelessness. Uh, so very excited to talk about that. Uh, if you want to be with us today, send us an email, beacon at EWTN.com. Of course, uh, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is something you can be a part of here with EWT and radio, and each and every day, 8 a.m. Eastern with EWT and television and radio, if you also want to get in on some email that allows you to have an interactive experience, make sure you check that out, EWTN.com, and simply click on subscribe. All right, well, it's now time for the Soulful Psalms segment of Beacon of Truth. And uh, today we're taking a look at Psalm 98, finishing our look at Psalm 98. Now, Psalm 98 is in book four of the Psalms, Psalms 90 to 106. Most of the Psalms in book four are unattributed, uh, except for the Psalms attributed to uh, David. You know, like I said, David is the only one that has uh, psalms in all five books of the psalms. So we're going to take a look at uh, verses 5 through 9 of Psalm 98, which we already started looking at before. The prescript in verse 1, very simple, uh, a psalm or mismor in, in Hebrew. It just says a psalm, okay? So starting at verse 5, it says, sing psalms to the Lord with the harp. With the harp and the sound of song, with trumpets and the sound of the horn, raise a shout before the king, the Lord. 
right? So, uh, you know, we talk about music a lot on, on Beacon of Truth. Of course, the the Psalms are part of the Sefer Telachim, or the book of sung praises, right? The, the, the uh, Jewish hymnal, which we, of course, use in every holy sacrifice of the Mass as Catholics as well. You know, and, and uh, you know, typically not weekday masses, but typically on Sunday, the Psalms are sung. And we see that we uh, honor and praise God through music, right? Through music. You know, they talk about the harp and the trumpets and the horn and singing, right? And, and so we, we, this is the way that we honor God, right? By using the, our senses, all of our senses and engaging uh, the reality and acknowledgement of who God is and how he works in the world and how he works in our lives. And uh, the, the psalmist continues, let the sea and all within it thunder, the world and, and, and all who dwell in it. So now he first talks about how we honor and worship God through, through song and praise and worship. And, and now he's talking about how nature does it. How does nature sing? How does nature uh, use instrumentation, if you will? Well, by simply being what they were created to be. Let the sea and all within it thunder, right? Uh, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. So the rivers, you know, like, like clapping their hands, like a, a, mus a musicality to the rhythm of nature, to the rhythm of life. The hills ring out their joy, right? The sound of music. Remember that movie, The Hills Are Alive with the sound of music. You know, so we see even nature, in a sense, participating in this worship in a, in a musical way, the way the psalmist is portraying, you know, a nature in a very musical way, uh, just by being what God created them to be, singing out their praise and joy to the Lord. Uh, the hills ring out their joy at the presence of the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. Right, so all of this worship, all of this praise is in, in for what? In preparation for the coming of the Lord, which is exactly what we're doing now. Right, we're we're about to get into the season of Advent, and Advent means the coming. Right, the, the preparing for Christ to come into the world and into our lives. And then finally, the the last part of verse nine, He will judge the world with justice, and the peoples with fairness. Right. And so a beautiful reminder here at the end that all the praise and all the worship and all the glory of all creation, right, of all created reality is pointing us and directing us toward our ultimate end, deep, intimate relationship with God. And that God is a God of justice and a God of, uh, of right judgment and fairness, right? So, so it's a beautiful relationship, the, the gift of ourselves to God and God gives uh, God giving his gifts back to us as well. And speaking of giving gifts, we're so excited today to have uh, Deacon Mike Oles on with us. Uh, he is the founder uh, of an incredible apostolate called Off the Streets. So even before Deacon Mike was ordained, he started volunteering uh, one night a month in, at a Dorothy Day House, a homeless shelter uh, in Danbury, Connecticut. And, uh, uh, and it was that experience that kind of got him started, you know, on this, uh, uh, on, on this road to, to beginning off the streets. And so, uh, Deacon Mike, you know, welcome to Beacon of Truth. And I think, I think we've been ordained about the same time. I, think I, I, was, I, was, I think you were ordained in 2002, and I was ordained in 2002 as well. Uh, so I think we share that together. But uh, Deacon Mike, welcome, welcome, welcome to Beacon of Truth. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm very excited to be here today with you. All right. So, so Deacon Mike, this is probably the first time that uh, that some uh, of our uh, EWTN family uh, has heard about you. So why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your vocation story, you know, how you felt God was calling you to, to the diaconate. And... Um, uh, also, uh, um, uh, how, you know, how you got, uh, started in this particular, uh, work that you're doing with, with the homeless. Right. So, uh, when I retired from the air force, I, uh, retired in 1984 and, uh, I was asked to, um, I went to a, uh, ecumenical meeting one night 
and I think it was just before Advent, uh, and there was a, a volunteer that was talking about the Dorothy Day Hospitality House, which was a homeless shelter, and he was looking for volunteers. So I had no idea. I didn't even know if homeless was one word or two words. I had not, no idea about the homeless whatsoever. So I volunteered. And then reality set in for me when I showed up at the shelter and realized just how awful it is for this existence. Um, and I, I, I really tried to get out of volunteering, but somehow I just stayed with it. But uh, every night was the same kind of thing. I'd show up at the shelter and uh, there would be maybe 25 people at the door. We could only take 16. So we came up with an idea for just doing like a little lottery. That's how we started. And we would uh, give every one of the people that was there waiting uh, a lottery ticket. And then we'd call out the first 16. And those are the ones that got in. But every night was the same kind of routine. And uh, over a period of several years, I got to know a lot of the homeless. And I was really like stunned that they couldn't just by their own bootstraps, just get out of that situation. So I didn't understand that at all. And then there were some uh, some of the guests that were showing up that seemed to be able-bodied. Uh, there was one particular fellow by the name of Mike Hewson. He was a Vietnam vet, and he'd show up every night. And uh, I chastised him actually in public because I felt like he could have gotten himself out of the shelter and made space for somebody else. So over the years, I got to know Mike a lot, and I, I would chastise him in public, um, trying to get him to, you know, get out of there and uh, leave room for other people. So I had this idea that he had wasted his whole life. And uh, Connecticut can get really brutally cold in the winter. And it was one, um, it was in February of one year where I would open up the shelter each night. So the way this worked was, the shelter was in a dark area behind a parking lot. Uh, and uh, you'd show up at the shelter uh, maybe at uh, 9 o'clock. But there had been people waiting there for two hours maybe even just to try to get in. Hopefully uh, hopefully that they would get in. Uh, and so here's this Monday night. And I show up. It was my night of the first night of the week. And there's Mike Cusin in line. And so I saw him and I just brutally yelled at him and said, uh, Mike, you're, you're, you're taking other people's places. But I gave him his lottery ticket. You know, he didn't get in that night. And then uh, the next night, and again, it was uh, like ice and snow, bitter temperatures. People had been waiting in line for two hours, maybe just to get a chance to get into the shelter. And there's Mike again. So I'm really furious with him. And uh, I said, Mike, you know, you're just, you're just wasting your whole life. What are you doing? And uh, so Wednesday came, I show up at the shelter, I, I get out of my car, just barely, barely survived just getting from the car into the shelter. Meanwhile, people have been waiting for two hours. And I, I see Mike in line, and now I see he looks really kind of grayish blue. So I'm, I said to myself, okay, if he doesn't get in tonight, I better take him to the hospital because he looks like he's really about ready to die. So I, I call out the numbers. He, he doesn't get in. So after I assigned the 16 people their beds, I went out to find Mike. He was gone. Thursday, the same sort of thing. I show up at the shelter. Everybody just, just, you know, just, uh, just completely worn out. And there's Mike. And I, I thought to myself, I'm going to fake the lottery today. I'm going to let Mike get in. And as I walked into the shelter, I, I, some inner voice said, no, you can't do this. You can't do this. Just let him, just work the lottery like you're doing. So I call up the numbers. Wouldn't you know, Mike gets in. I couldn't believe it. And uh, so I'm joyfully you know, assigning beds. And all of a sudden, there's a tap on my shoulder. And it's Mike. And uh, I don't pay attention. So then he hits me on the shoulder and he, says, I'm giving up my bed. So now I'm really, uh, I said, Mike, you look delirious. Take your bed. He said, no, there's somebody outside needs it more than me. So I look out the door. There's, I can't see anybody. It's all black. 
he says, come on with me. And we go to a corner of the parking lot and there's a lump and it was a woman. And he says, I'm giving up my bed to this woman. And uh, she's, I, I look at her and I didn't recognize her and he didn't know her either. She said it was her first night here in Danbury, Connecticut. So when I looked at Mike again, I said, you mean you're going to give up your bed to a woman you don't even know, a perfect stranger? And he said, yes. And I said, then it was like a lightning bolt hit me. Instead of seeing Mike as a wasted life, I saw, I saw him transfigured as if he were Christ himself. Oh, awesome. Well, more with uh, Deacon Mike talking about his incredible apostolate off the streets. Uh, if you want to be with us today, send us an email, beacon at EWTN.com. You know, that, that sounds like kind of music you hear like in a mall, like in an elevator, something like that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that kind it, of what they, they play, they, you know, they get people in the mood to shop and to spend their money. I always think of like orchestrated or like soundtracks when you see like if you're watching a holiday classic like Home Alone or something, it's like the music montage as they're going through the store. Like that's how I, that's how I hear it in my head. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. Well, again, music is an important part of... Uh, this you know holiday holiday season holy day season yep you know um so that and again a lot of people's memories are drawn to the music sure. now even people who don't go to church you know the, except for maybe christmas or easter and kind of holiday holiday christians um you know it's it's often the music mm -hmm. that they remember you know it kind of draws them back um you know uh to to at least coming attending church during this time of year amen yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and you're listening to Beacon of Truth on EW10 Global Catholic Radio Network. And today we're talking with Deacon Mike Oles about his incredible apostolate off the streets. We heard an incredible story uh, in the, the, the last segment, Deacon Mike talking about introducing us to the work that he's doing and the impact he's having on the lives of so many people, our homeless brothers and sisters. You want to be with us today. Send us an email, beacon at EWTN.com. I want to remind you over the holidays, Family Theater Classic Radio, always a fun time with your family. Sunday nights, 1130 Eastern, and of course on demand when you check us out and download our mobile app and uh, stream us at EWTN.com slash radio. All right. Well, we're joined uh, today by Deacon Mike Oles talking about Off the Streets uh, Deacon Mike and I think have been ordained uh, the same amount of time. We we're both ordained in 2002. And, uh, you know, what's, what's beautiful about diaconal ministry is that uh, when a man is called, you know, we're called to serve, of course, in the church, right, in the parish, but also outside of the, the, the parish as well. You know, my work involves uh, uh, speaking and writing and preaching, and Deacon Mike's work involves an incredible apostolate caught off the streets um and he's, he's he's telling us all about that today so deacon mike thank you for first of all for sharing in the in the last uh part of the show the incredible story and and the humility of sharing that story with us because you I may mean, hear you are berating a, a homeless person that, that you think he that you, know, you think he's taking someone else's spot but then you see really the humanity and you see christ in that person standing in front of you, which is so important um, w when you're doing uh, the, the kind of work um, that you've been called by God to do in Off the Streets. So, so, so tell us a little bit about how, you, how Off the Streets got started. So you had this incredible experience in the homeless shelter, but how did, how did, the, you, uh, how did God call you to, to begin this work of Off the Streets? Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, I was asked by a DRE, a director of religious ed, uh, one year to uh, talk to a group of 6th, uh, 7th, and 8th graders about homelessness. So, of course, I'd been working in the shelter for many years, and I thought, well, I'm going to let a homeless person describe it themselves. So I thought this would be a, a simple thing. And I went to some of my homeless friends and I said, hey, how would you like to talk to a group of uh, about 60 kids about your experiences homeless? 
And every one of them turned me, no, 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 I can't do that. I'm too afraid. I'm too ashamed, whatever. So I had to sweeten the pot. And I said, okay, look, if one of you takes up this challenge, I'll put you up in a nice motel for the night. So I finally got one guy to do it. And we go, as we're going down, he says, they're going to have to ask me questions because I'm so embarrassed. So we get started and uh, he tells his story about how he became homeless and, uh, and they asked him questions about, do you use drugs? Or, How about your family? Does your family help you? Do you have a job? You know, why are you homeless? And so forth. And they got, they connected with him. And so um, this went on for like an hour and a half. And it was a Monday night. So they'd been in school all day. Now they're religious ed. And they, they stayed for an hour and a half. They were totally intrigued with him. And I took him to the motel. We thought that was the end of it. And then I get a, I get a call about two weeks later from the DRE. She said, the kids were so excited. Uh, they want to help uh, Andrew, and uh, they raised some money. I said, oh, that's nice. So uh, they said, but the pastor wants to give you this money. So I brought Andrew down with me, went to a mass, and the DREs there, some of the kids, and they presented me with a check for 750 bucks. Oh, wow. I said, oh, that's really nice. Thank you very much. So then Andrew and I, we we left, and um, so I put the, put the check on my dresser, and I uh, the, uh, two weeks later, I get a call from the DRE. Deacon Holes, Deacon Holes, uh, where's where's Andrew living now? You know, and I said, oh, you know, I've been kind of busy. I haven't gotten to you. I had no idea what to do with the seven hundred fifty dollars. Then she starts calling me again and again and again. You know, the evil judge in scripture. You know, with the widows there, and she wants justice. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really care that much about Andrew, but I just had to get these kids in the DRE off my back because I was sweating it. Okay, every time she called me, I, said, I haven't gotten to you. So finally. Out of desperation, I said, look at Andrew. I said, if you just uh, come up with a way to pay a rent going forward, find a landlord that will take you in. Uh, we'll use some of this money for a security deposit, and then I'll use the rest of it to get you a bed and other stuff. Well, it worked. And then over the next three years, I used the same uh, pattern of, tr of talking to a group of kids and then encouraging them to take that homeless person that I brought, different ones each time. So over a period of three years, we took nine homeless people off the streets. And that's what I thought was going to be the, the mechanism. And the Holy Spirit's beating you around the head and said, what is the matter with you, deacon? These kids are taking kids off the streets. Why can't you as a deacon do something more? So I kept, and then I started looking at, okay, what would it take to start a, a program to help people off the streets? And I, I, I looked at the 501c3 and all this paperwork, and I thought, well, where am I going to pay for a secretary, and who's going to answer the phones, and all of this sort of stuff. And I built up this big brick wall that said, I can't do this, I can't do this. And then one day, I found out I had cancer, and I thought, okay, gee, I don't have very much longer to live. I better do something now or die trying. So I started a pro program called Off the Streets, and what the idea behind it is is we'll provide a security deposit and all the furniture that a, that a person or, or family needs as long as they have a way to pay a rent going forward. And that became the foundation for Off the Streets. Wow. Uh, that's, that's an awesome story. Um, and what a beautiful beginning. You know, because uh, Jesus says, unless you have a heart of, of a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And so it's I think it's quite appropriate um, that, uh, you know, these you, you bring the homeless people to the children. And it is the children and their hearts are so open uh, to want to to help people moving forward as a catalyst for the work that that uh, you're doing now. And also to see how sometimes, you know, we put our own obstacles up in the way of the Holy Spirit trying to, you know, the Holy Spirit wants to do something. We're the ones, you know, that are preventing the Holy Spirit from working. But you were able to, to break through that and start this uh, uh, incredible uh, uh, work that you're doing for the homeless. So, okay, so the, in, in the beautiful model that you outlined, uh, you talked about you provide the security deposit and the furniture as long as they're able to, pay the rent moving forward but how do you help them with that part of it is it about helping them to find the job is it about like you know, finding them some clothes for, uh, interviewing skills do you have maybe volunteer dentists that may help somebody you know fix their teeth so they look presentable for an interview you know uh, how, how does all that piece of it work right so we know that uh there are lots of, of uh agencies that help the homeless 
uh, like Catholic Charities, uh, like St. Vincent de Paul. There's many secular organizations. We also know how difficult it is to do that case management, if you will. You come across a family and they're homeless. Well, how do they become homeless? Uh, what are their financial liabilities? What are their uh, ability to do a job? Um, you know, where are they going to find a place to live? So all these things are already in place in most cities, okay? Uh, so we're just like a missing the like a missing piece, just one piece of the puzzle. So when the way it works is this. First of all, we take no government funding and we have no paid staff and we have almost no overhead expenses. So that first of all, so the money comes in to us and is almost always used for security deposits. And we take no government funding because the government usually has restrictions on who can be helped and who can't be helped and all these requirements and so forth. And we try to operate off the streets in a formless way, a formless way, like the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're guided by the Holy Spirit. And the, of course, the Holy Spirit is formless and we try to be formless. So when we get a referral from, let's say, Catholic Charities, uh, that says, okay, we found a place for this family to live. They have a way to pay a rent because they have either subsidized housing or a job. Uh, and they, we found a willing landlord and so forth. Uh, all they need is a security deposit and some furniture. Bingo. The day that we get that referral, we send the check directly to the landlord. We haven't even seen the homeless person or family. We haven't even seen them. And there's no paperwork required between us and the other agencies, which is usually a bureaucratic de delay. And and when, when there's a delay like that, the landlord who has this low-cost place may have already rented the place out. So we want to take advantage. As soon as that landlord opens the door, we want to be able to be there for them. Um, furniture, every Catholic that I know of likes to get rid of stuff, okay? <laughs> so... Furniture is not the problem. It's deciding what we can take and what we can't take. Mm -hmm. So these these low-cost apartments, usually they're very small, limited space. So we only can take small furniture, okay? Uh, no big high boys and things like that, uh, but, uh, but, but plenty of basic furniture, pots, pans, dishes, all those sorts of things. The basic things that they need to move into a place, uh, that we, we, we get. Now, here's the big thing, okay? As deacons and priests, we are preaching constantly at the altar um, and talking about helping the homeless. We Our intercessions oftentimes talk about the homeless. Yep. And the people don't know how to help, okay? Yeah. This is where, this, is a, this opens up a huge uh, potential for the parish to actually be able to help the homeless in a permanent way not just in a soup kitchen or an emergency shelter or the food bank, but no, in actually helping people in a permanent way to get off the streets. So parishioners, at, once they find out how off the streets operates, they, they gravitate to off the streets because when they do this, it's not like sending a check to the SPCA or to the St. Uh, to Saint, uh, whatever, St. Vincent de Paul or another charity. It's actually immersion. All right. So the family that we're helping when we bring the furniture to them, okay, we're seeing the joy in their faces. For example, one time we were helping a mother and a nine year old child, and she asked for beds and dressers and stuff like that. And we had everything that we needed, she needed, uh, except for one item. So we're, we're driving down to, to bring this to her apartment. And one of the people, one of the volunteers decides to stop into Walmart picks up the missing item for 12 item, twelve bucks. We go down there, we give her the bed, the dressers, and helping set everything up. And then when we gave her this box that had just come from Walmart, she broke down and cried. So we, we didn't know what happened here. And she said, well, my son, Alex, who's nine years old, when he found out that we're going to move into a real house, he said, mom, could you make me a piece of toast? And she said, well, we won't have a toaster. And when she got this toaster that came from Walmart, she broke down and cried. So I've been thinking of an anniversary present for my wife. I want to get her to cry, and I'm thinking about a toaster, but I better not. Yeah. <laughs> You're listening to Beacon of Truth. I'm your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and we're talking today in this post-Thanksgiving show, the day after Thanksgiving, 
Uh, we're talking about helping the homeless. We're talking with, talking with Deacon Mike Oles about an incredible apostolate. Uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, my heart is just so deeply moved right now listening to Deacon Mike talk about off the streets, an incredible apostolate that he's been sharing with us, how the Holy Spirit uh, uh, gave him the vision of starting this apostle after he had been working with in a homeless shelter prior uh, to this. And, at, and I love hearing how you're working with different agencies because sometimes we can uh, get in, work in silos. You know, like, oh, Catholic Charities is doing their thing and St. Vincent Paul is doing their thing and Off the Streets is doing their thing. But, but the way you're working together, that's what we need to do. Work together as the body of Christ to help build up that body of Christ and restore dignity to uh, all of our brothers and sisters who are homeless. And what I love about Off the Streets, you're not just putting a Band-Aid on the problem. You're actually helping people get off the streets and, and into proper housing. I mean, you're actually, uh, little by little in your own way, helping to solve this, this problem of homelessness. Now, now Deacon Mike, I know that this started um, in Connecticut, right? Danbury, Connecticut, in the area. But but has this now? And I know it's expanded. How did this begin to grow? Because now you're in a number of other states besides just Connecticut. I mean, was this? And how did your bishop uh, feel about this? And is he involved in any way in what you're doing? Or is he just giving his his support? Right. So when we started this, of course, I started this in, in Danbury, Connecticut, and then uh, uh, we started this in 2009 in Connecticut, and then we moved down to Lancaster, Pennsylvania in 2012. And uh, so, of course, this off the streets that I had started in Connecticut it was like really on my mind. And I said to my wife, I said, I'm going to try to start a chapter here in Lancaster. And she said, well, she said, if you start a chapter you cannot run the chapter because it'll become a one-off. In other words, it'll be like you as the leader. You have to figure out how to get other leadership involved. If you if you don't, it's going to be a one-off. So I went down to uh, so I went down to the day center here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and uh, I was talking to the at that time uh, the day center uh, one of the day center people, and I said. Um, I'm talking about off the streets. I said, what do you think about starting one here? What if I, what if I started one here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania? He says, he points me to two uh, nine foot tables covered with literature. And he says, we have all the help we need for the homeless. Uh, the, the, you know, we don't need any more. So I just, I, I saw a, a, a homeless couple there and I just got into conversation with them, found out they'd been married for 25 years. They were homeless. They were both on SSI. So they're getting secure, Social Security. And what they were doing was the first first seven or eight days of the month, they would spend in a motel. And, of course, their money would run out really quickly. And, I, and then they would stay at the homeless shelter if they could get in for the rest of the month. I said, how would you like to have your own place? And when I described this to them, they said, wow, that'd be fantastic. So they were working with a caseworker of an agency and it was a wonderful uh, agency. And I, I, ca I called their caseworker and I said, what do you think if we uh, came up with a security deposit for these people and all the furniture, would that help? And she said, that would be great. And so this family, we worked with this other agency and uh, they had found them a place to live and stuff. As soon as they found them that place, of course, that day, I said, we're going to send the check directly. And I hadn't even started the chapter yet, okay? But it then it took off, okay? And when I introduced uh, Off the Streets to the parish family in a, in a homily, and I said, we'll have a meeting to discuss it, I had 25 people from the parish show up that day. So now we have now taken that model, that very simple model, and we, we expanded it to six states, we uh, started in Connecticut, then we went to Pennsylvania, then we went to uh, uh, Huntington Beach, California, we went to the state of Washington, and now we're in six chapters. We have now taken 10,000 people off the streets. About 80% wow. of them are women and children. So when we look at the uh, uh, the daily, uh, as we're making our daily drive and we see the guy with the cardboard sign, okay, lots of those people that have those cardboard signs aren't even homeless, but it's a nice way for them to get a little extra money, okay? So that's what, you know, 
And we, when we look at the homeless that way, we're, we're not seeing the hidden homeless. We're not seeing the mothers and fathers that have been evicted from their places because the landlord decided to sell the place or a mother who decides to leave a bad relationship with her kids. When the mother leaves that re bad relationship, <clears throat> she's completely, usually completely desperate, okay? And she cannot panhandle, okay? First of all, she wouldn't want to panhandle, but she cannot panhandle because the state will probably take her kids away for abuse. So if she loses her kids, okay, it's disastrous because then she's got to find an attorney that's going to be willing to help her get them back. So she'll do anything she can to, to make sure that they do not look or feel homeless. So, for example, even in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, we have maybe a thousand kids registered in the school system that are registered as homeless. They don't have a permanent home. So when the kids go to school, the mothers will sp spare no expense to make sure that the kids were wearing the right jeans and they got to have the rip, rip in the right pair, place, okay, and they got to have the right uh, uh, the right uh, sneakers or whatever that they call them now, the Jordans and stuff. She will spare no expense so that those kids, when they go to school, they'll fit in. They won't be pointed at, okay? When, when our parishioners see the joy on the people's faces of getting simple things that we all take for granted, they're hooked for life. So a lot of our volunteers, uh, for example, we have like, uh, I think it's close to like 80 or 90 active volunteers here in, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania alone. Uh, and they just keep coming back and back and back and introducing new people. Uh, we have high school students who, uh, when they made uh, some deliveries with their parents, uh, we had uh, one group of, of kids who decided to call themselves ambassadors for off the streets. And what they do is they provide books and stuff like that for kids. Uh, and, uh, and when we make deliveries of the furniture and stuff, those books are right in there. One time we made a delivery of books and uh, it was the wrong age group. It wasn't, these were like older kids and uh, they, they had put together books for like young kids. And it turns out it worked out really good because those books, the, 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 uh, the parents did not speak English. So to have like second or third grade books with a lot of pictures and, and a few words, that helped their parents learn the English language. So you can see all these things and they, they, and it all, it all spreads. And so whenever we get a, um, an entry point into a, a parish, and this is a key thing, uh, uh, the, par the parishioners will almost always, almost always respond. Uh, we had uh, uh, some companies that would, uh, you know, we, we try to write grants and stuff like that. And one company writes back and says, uh, we like what you're doing, but we don't want to use our money for security deposits. Do you have any, uh, do you have any uh, capital programs? We said, well, it'd be nice if we had a, a, a closed-in van, like a truck. And they said, oh, we can provide a truck. And now we've gotten trucks in uh, several of our uh, locations. We got a brand new one that was donated uh, to us. Uh, it's like $70,000 truck. And uh, just uh, because... People want to help. Oh, that's awesome. I'm Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and you're listening to Beacon of Truth. And today we're talking with Deacon Mike Oles about his incredible apostolate uh, off the streets, which is really uh, in, a, in a real tangible way using the, the power of the body of Christ in the church to really get people off the streets. Now put a Band-Aid on it. Uh, not a, a temporary situation, but really restoring the dignity of our brothers and sisters who are homeless, really helping them to get off the streets into a permanent housing situation. And, uh, you know, I, uh, Deacon, my, I, I, how, I'm just, I'm just floored right now. Uh, I mean, this should be the model for the entire country. Uh, I mean, it's it's working. What you're doing is working. That's why you have these volunteers. They see that it's actually working, that it truly is making a difference in the lives of real people and real families. You know, so so uh, what have you gotten interest from other places or how are you working to expand this this work of the Holy Spirit? So uh, you, you asked about the bishop. You asked about the priests, you know, how they support it. Uh, Bishop Gaynor, who was the 11th Bishop of Harrisburg. Now, remember, I only just came down here a few years ago. 
when Bishop Gaynor heard about off the streets, uh, here, here's what happened. I, at, when I reached age 75, I have to write to the bishop, yep. you know, basically beg the bishop each year to keep my diaconal faculties. So I was writing to the bishop Gaynor one year, and I said, uh, you know, I'd like to retain my diaconal faculties for another year. And I said, oh, by the way, would you have anything to say about off the streets? And I was just expecting him to say, oh, I'll keep up the good work or something, you know. He writes back a, a phrase which which is seared into my mind. He talked about the prophetic witness of off the streets giving hope to the homeless. It like it burnt, it seared into my brain. Okay, uh, so much so that I'd already written one book about off the streets, but this encouraged me to write another book, and I asked basically permission from the bishop, <laughs> the bishop's office, to use that as the title of the book, the prophetic witness of off the streets. Then our new bishop came in, and his his name, Bishop uh, uh, Senior, he asked me, how can I become a an advocate for off the streets? Just by those very words, he gave me encouragement. So we have strong, strong endorsements from bishops here, from our parish uh, family, from, from everyone. All right. Awesome, man. We've been speaking with Deacon Mike Olds about his incredible apostolate off the streets. Uh, so great for you to, that you could be with us today, Deacon Mike. Remember, you can stream today's show by visiting Podcast Central at EW10.com slash radio. And I'm sure you're going to want to share this show with all of your family, friends, priests, and bishops. Until we're together again, my friends, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>